is Mark Harrison, Managing Director of Property at Acclaimed Private Finance and Investment House, Wingate. Mark, thanks for your time this afternoon. You mentioned in an article last week that there's been real buoyancy within the developer market in terms of getting projects on the drawing board. What's driving this buoyancy and, and what's your outlook for the short to medium term? I think the, uh, the, one of the key drivers is the lack of activity through 2020. I think we saw with, uh, with COVID, um, it created a wave of, of fear, I guess, in the short term and, and then a, and a wait and hold mindset after that. So on the back of that, and the fact that the market was already slowing down um, pre-COVID, um, we've got a gap and, uh, and our, our clients are certainly looking at the market and seeing there to be an opportunity now to get their projects back into the assembly line um, with a view, I think, to launching a lot of residential projects in the latter half of 2021. And what are the major trends you're seeing in the current market and how are your developer clients positioning their pipelines to take advantage of current opportunities? Well, I think there's been a a, a flight towards more owner-occupier product in the apartment space for some time, and that's been driven by a lot of demographic issues. I think es empty nesters are now seeing the advantages of moving into apartment living in their latter years. Um, the, the, uh, the house being a great source of superannuation, um, downsizing into a more secure environment. Um, Pre-COVID, of course, there was a whole sense of, of travel, travel's become much easier for the population. And so with that, you want a low maintenance living um, space. So that has been a great driver uh, of the apartment market. And so we've been focusing a lot on that. And I think the other issue that's happened is the difficulty in sell it, selling off the plan. So the investor market has really slowed. And that happened back some years ago when the, uh, the government, both state and federal, started implementing uh, legislation to slow that down in the way of foreign taxes, um, capital constraints out of China, um, stamp duty being removed off the plan for purchases in Victoria. So all of that played into the, into the um, trend of slowing um, off the plan sales to investors. And so developers really had to look at alternative markets as well to actually keep their businesses moving. And which asset classes or project types are you most concerned about, particularly given the challenges of last year, and how has Wingate as a business responded to those challenges? Uh, we haven't seen any distress in any particular areas at this point. I think that we've got a watch and, uh, a watch and hold brief on retail. Uh, I think non-discretionary retail is still appearing to be very strong. There's been a real trend towards online. We've COVID's probably fast-tracked Australia in that regard, whether it's fast-tracked at one or two years or even five to 10 years, I don't know. But I think we've all had to be um, conditioned to buying our items online, not being allowed to leave the house, particularly in Victoria, has meant that uh, we're just used to, uh, to online delivery. So, you know, I think there's some question marks over some of the retail, um, the higher-end retail, certain fashion. Uh, and office, I guess, the jury's out. Uh, I'm hearing mixed reports. From a personal perspective, we're very much back on deck business as usual as it was pre-COVID now. Um, we think that you know, there'll be a lot of businesses where the whole cultural component of their business is critical and it's very hard to replicate online. In relation to development site values, have you found any pockets of distress amongst developers that have led to good buying opportunities? Not really. Um, it's a bit surprising. I, I thought that that would probably be the case. There was a lot of sites purchased in, in the sort of preceding few years, uh, particularly by some offshore developers, but not exclusively. Um, I think many people were seeing the buoyancy in the market and they buy sites um, under the uh, assumptions of being able to sell product at certain price points on completion. Um, they certainly reset to some extent pre-COVID and then there really wasn't much of a market during 2020. But notwithstanding that, and there has been some downward pressure on the value of those sites, we haven't seen them come to market. I think that developers have uh, obviously had enough equity or enough supportive lenders to, uh, to get them through. Now, you've been involved in property and property finance for over 20 years. How would you compare the, the current economic and property cycle to that of previous cycles, whether it's the GFC or otherwise? Yeah, it's an interesting question. This correction or this period um, may not be a correction but this period is very different to the GFC and, and the key difference for me is liquidity. In the GFC it was a financial crisis by definition 
and there was not a lot of liquidity in the marketplace and businesses like Wingate were able to step up and fill a void that the gap that the, of, of, that the banks had left in the marketplace and particularly that had been left by the withdrawal from the market of the foreign banks that had to sort of go back home to put out their domestic fires um, and also the non-bank sector in Australia which was very badly affected in the GFC. If we fast forward now to the COVID era, um, we're not dealing with a financial crisis. In fact, we've actually got huge amounts of liquidity in the marketplace at the moment because we've seen a, a whole influx of foreign capital looking to invest in private debt. We've seen the private debt space actually become almost an asset class in its own right. You know, super funds, both onshore and offshore, starting to invest in that sector. So there really is a lot of liquidity to prop the market up and on the back of very low interest rates. Um, I'm not seeing a correction. On the contrary, what we're seeing at the moment is real buoyancy in the market. Um, off the plan sales starting to slowly recover, but certainly um, residential sales along the eastern seaboard very, very strong. Now, Wingate recently partnered with leading developer Tim Gurner on a $600 million plus mixed use resort in, uh, in Buds Beach on the Gold Coast. Over the past 12 to 24 months in particular, there's been a significant flow of capital into southeast Queensland, as you would have seen. What's your perspective on the Gold Coast market and perhaps further south in Byron Bay as well? Again, the COVID situation globally has brought a strong focus back to domestic locations within Australia, particularly for holidays, tourist destinations. Put simply, we're not allowed to travel overseas, so we want to go somewhere. I read recently over the Easter weekend that Virgin sold more airline tickets over that weekend than they've ever sold in their history. Uh, now, I know it was on the back of some very cheap fares, but I think that there's a very strong focus on these domestic tourist locations. And so that's fed. We've seen residential prices in Byron Bay um, spike sharply through 2020. And the Gold Coast has been through quite a lull. And we're now seeing real activity back on the Gold Coast. So I think it's playing into that theme. And I think that they've probably, I mean, Byron Bay is a little unique in that it's, and obviously we've, um, you know, we've got a significant investment in Byron Bay, so we know that market and we're watching that market quite closely. Um, Gold Coast is a little different. It has had a, a, a long history of a boom and bust economy. I think at the moment it's starting to go through one of its early boom periods. So we're very excited with the joint venture with, uh, with Tim and it's a terrific opportunity. The asset you mentioned there in Byron Bay is Mercato on Byron. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came into your ownership and where the asset's at today? Yeah, sure. So we were introduced to the landowner of that site um, about five years ago by, a, um, by one of our investors, actually, um, who I think shared the same accountant. So it just came via a referral source and we just saw it as a, a terrific opportunity. It's unique. At Wingate, we really specialise in bespoke investment opportunities, giving access to our investor clients, transactions that they otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, get access to and this fitted that uh, criteria perfectly. And more broadly speaking, are there any geographic regions that you're bullish on or any that you're actively avoiding? I, I wouldn't say we're actively avoiding any regions. We're definitely, as I mentioned earlier, seeing a, a, a renewal of um, residential activity and, and strong residential, residential activity along the eastern seaboard, um, in the capital cities particularly. Um, also in Perth, actually, we've got some exposure in WA, but where we're actually having more of a focus than we have previous or prior to, to the COVID uh, time in 2020 is some regional areas. So we've got more deals on our books now in places like Newcastle and Wollongong in New South Wales, in Melbourne, Geelong region, looking at Bendigo, Ballarat. And I think that, again, you know, COVID's had an impact on the way people view their life and their lifestyle and what's important to them. And perhaps even the, uh, the need and importance of open space. So um, maybe that's leading to it, but we're certainly seeing a, a trend. And I think the other thing that's driving regional activity is affordability, you know, and particularly with interest rates where they are and with the level of residential activity we're seeing in the markets now, um, prices are gonna to continue to rise in the short term and that probably will drive people into regional areas as well for affordability reasons. 
What are the fundamentals that prospective clients need to have in order to build a relationship with Wingate? And conversely, what differentiates your positioning within the marketplace from others? Well, I think the first thing that Wingate is about is relationships and people. And from the very day we opened the doors, we, we always talked about treating other people's money as though it's our own and lifelong partnerships. And we've really lived by those principles from day one. So it is true, I mean, we all as principals invest in the transactions in our funds, along with many, many people that we know that are, are co-investing with us. And so it is our money sitting alongside our investors' money in every respect. And on the other side, with our developer clients, we treat them as partners. Yes, we lend money to them, or potentially we invest with them in, in the capital structure as equity. But regardless of as a lender, or as a principal investor, we treat them as partners. And so we're, we work with our clients when there are issues. I mean, you can never have, uh, you know, be as active in the lending space and investing space as Wingate is without having issues. But I think it's how you deal with adversity and how you deal with those challenges that sets us apart. And I think that's probably the big one, both in respect of how we've dealt with our investors and then also how we deal with our developer partners. And that's why we have such a strong track record and why we have such repeat business and long-standing clients. I want to ask you about your investment methodology. What are the, the main factors or fundamentals that you consider in your analysis? The number one non-negotiable is the integrity of the person that I'm doing business with. So I've learned over the years, um, sometimes the hard way, that you know, if you're dealing with quality people, you'll work together to deliver outcomes and you'll overcome, you're best equipped to overcome challenges. Conversely, if you're not dealing with that caliber of person, the opposite will apply. So that is the number one criteria. Beyond that, of course, we're going to assess the transaction um, in and of itself, um, location, product, markets, competition. Um, so all of those, they're, they're pretty, basic fundamentals um, around it, but we are very risk focused. So we're, we've found that great balance here at Wingate where we've got great commerciality, um, great flexibility, but with a risk first approach. And first and foremost for us, it's about preservation of capital. So when I'm investing in a transaction, once I've got past the, uh, and I've ticked the box on the counterparty, the next question is, how do I get my money back? How am I going to exit the, uh, the investment once I'm there? What are the scenarios that could play out? Do I have multiple ways that I could potentially manage and exit? Probably they're the, the key things for us. What effect do you think lower economic growth and stagnant population growth will have on Australia in the short to medium term, particularly for developers developing projects? Well, if you ask me that just as a standalone question, stagnant population growth will have quite a material impact on the Australian market uh, because we rely on, on migration, both for, for skills and for growth, and we've got so much land here. Um, but you can't ask it in isolation because it's really, there's so many other factors. And so whilst we've got no um, net migration at the moment, um, the market has pretty much been propped up by a whole lot of well, hundreds of thousands of expats that have come back into the country uh, during the COVID era, being domiciled over in the US or UK or parts of Asia and other regions in the world that want to come home, either because they've lost their jobs or because, again, COVID has pushed some, uh, some important buttons and, and brought some realisations home. So that's been an interesting dynamic because the majority of the people coming back into the country um, are coming from white collar jobs. So that's, there's been still, even through the COVID era, era quite a, um, a strong demand for inner ring housing in the capital cities, particularly Melbourne and Sydney, and that's really kept the prices up. Um, so we haven't had foreign migrants coming in, or not many through this period, but there still has been quite a lot of um, people coming back into the country. With the rollout of the vaccination. Now, I don't, I don't know that we're going to have a long period of time where there won't be population growth because I don't think the government have that many levers open to them anymore to uh, stimulate growth. Um, they certainly can't use interest rates because we're nearly, you know, we're at the bottom. So I think that we're going to see um, strong interest 
in Australia, and I'm hopeful that the government will come to the party and, and be reasonably nimble in the way they move. Um, we've got to get the foreign students back into the country. That's a really important driver for our economy. I think uh, the government, um, both federal and state, have been slow in that regard. And that's left some gaps. And I think, you know, Melbourne CBD is a great example where there's just way too much vacancy and, and retailers and, and other venue operators are really struggling. And it's taking some time to get that back on track. So foreign students is a big one. And I also think on the back of COVID that um, with the way that Australia as a country has managed the, um, the pandemic, where, and, and also the publicity that we've been receiving again on the back of a lot of these international um, celebrities and others coming to the country and, and making films here now, there's gonna be renewed interest in Australia uh, for a lot of reasons. And so I'm hopeful that uh, we won't have much of a period post uh, 2021 where there isn't uh, good inflows. Maybe a little bit early to tell, but as you mentioned, renewed interest in Australia. Have you seen that reflecting into the investor base of Wingate? Are you seeing global investors start to take a look at Australian commercial real estate and want to get a, their foot in the door via Wingate? We have, but it's not a new thing. That's not a 2021 phenomenal, a phenomenon or even a 2020 phenomenon. Um, with, um, with one of my partners, you know, I was travelling over to Asia, for example, in uh, 2011, 12, 13, trying to drum up interest in Australia, and it was, uh, it was a battle then. I was trying to sell the story that uh, Australia really was part of Asia and that these Asian funds should be looking to invest in, in Australia. And with, with lukewarm reception, but I reckon for the last five years, there's been very strong interest in, in Australia. And um, in recent years, there's been huge inflows of capital into Australia, buying Australian assets, investing in Australian infrastructure, with government in the private sector. So I don't think there's any greater uh, inflows at the moment or interest now. I think Australia's really on the radar as a very safe haven, stable government, transparent legal structure. In regard to loan to value ratios, have these changed over the past one to three years? And if so, how? From a Wingate perspective, uh, funnily enough, our LVR exposure has reduced over the last three years relative to where we were previously because we've moved very much from a uh, majority mezzanine lender into more of a senior debt provider. And there's a whole lot of dynamics that have been playing out in the, in the fund funding markets in Australia that have led to that and created great opportunities in that space. Um, but I think generally over, over recent years, LVRs have remained relatively stagnant. Um, banks go through cycles where they like certain assets relative to others, so they'll lend a little bit more there than they will on other sectors. Uh, but generally, there was a huge drop in, uh, in exposures post-GFC, and then we've seen them steadily climb with a few um, exceptions or blips along the way. You know, when APRA have stepped in to, you know, put a bit of uh, regulatory pressure on the banks, they've pulled back a little bit, but then the void has been filled by non-bank lenders. So generally, we've been in a very strong or stable property market for many years. Has there been a material change in the level of pre-sales required for projects that you're funding? There has been a material change, but that's been driven more by market forces than assessment of risk. So uh, put simply, we have reduced the, our pre-sale requirements significantly since where they, from where they were in the uh, earlier years of the, uh, the last decade. Uh, but that was also an era where you could sell off the plan very easily. So it was very easy for lenders to go into the market and require 80 to 100% debt cover from pre-sales because if, that, if developers weren't achieving that level of pre-sale, then there was a problem with their product. The market, it wasn't showing great market acceptance. Whereas in today's market, for the reasons I've outlined earlier, very difficult to sell to investors off the, off the plan. And owner occupiers don't really like to buy that many off the plan because they prefer to see and touch and feel the product. We're generally talking a, a you know, higher end product, better finishes, significantly more dollars. And so these people are more reluctant, these purchasers, to buy off the plan sight unseen. So as a lender, you meet the market, but then whilst the LVR has 
reduced, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, while the pre-sales have reduced, so has the LVR at the back end. So in the earlier days, if we were getting 100% debt cover, we might be happy to lend a higher LVR on completion because we'd mitigated the risk by virtue of having so many sales. If we're going into a transaction with limited pre-sales, then we're going to scale back the, uh, the total exposure. From an investor's perspective, do you have an average target rate of return that, you're, that you seek across your uh, portfolio? No, we don't have an average rate of return. We've got a, a, our flagship fund, which is our Wingate Investment Partners Trust, which we call as WIP, but that has been driven by a whole variety of, of debt investments. And so the mezzanine investments would generate a higher return, obviously, than the senior debt. So for us, it's not as much about a target return, but about pricing for risk. And our investors understand that, and that's why they invest with Wingate. So if we talk to an investor today and they're getting a 7% return or a 6.5% return on a really well-secured, lowly geared senior debt position, they're going to be just as comfortable, probably more comfortable, than a 14% uh, a mezzanine facility that's geared at 80%. So it really is horses for courses, and we would ne we'd never look at it uh, within those parameters, and certainly within my business, as target returns. Because that, for me, that's the wrong driver. For me, the driver is about, as I've mentioned earlier, preservation of capital and pricing for risk and understanding that. How would you evaluate your risk appetite as a business now compared to say five or 10 years ago? One of the things we've been really good at at Wingate is identifying the sectors of the market, the, the niche areas, the geographies where there's good opportunities to invest. And I think now is no different. Our appetite for investment has always been there. It's just around finding the right areas. So at the moment, I've mentioned earlier, the areas that I think there's growth. Um, we're certainly seeing terrific growth in the residential market at the moment. Um, as a business, at, uh, we are keen to invest in more residential developments, um, but uh, certainly in the equity space, just as well as the debt. Over the next 12 months, um, I can see an undersupply coming. I think that there has been a lack of supply already brewing. Um, the market slowed a touch in sort of pre-COVID years, so it probably created a better balance, but on the back of there being very little delivery through 2020 and probably through 21, because it takes time, the lag to get the deals up and then deliver to the market, I'm seeing 22, 23 as providing undersupply potential. And so we are keen in that space. Again, I'm keen in some of the regional areas. Um, I'm watching certain sectors as well. But it, for us, it's just always about assessing the market dynamic at the time and, and looking at those macro and micro issues. So Mark, I want to ask, from an investor's perspective, do you have an average target rate of return that you can disclose? We don't have an average target rate of return. We've always assessed our transactions and priced our transactions based on risk. Um, since we, we've got our flagship debt fund known as Wingate Investment Partners Trust, that's been going for about nine years and its average IRR over that period is 11%, around 11%. But we never set out to deliver 11%. It's a, the fund is a concoction of mezzanine investments and senior debt investments. Some investments may be priced in the mid-teens, some investments are priced in the uh, mid single digits. And so it's delivered that average return. And I think ultimately that's why our investors come to Wingate and why they trust us, that we, that we look at investments on their merit, we price for risk. First and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, we're always looking at the downside aspects of it and understanding it, understand the risk parameters, and then we price accordingly. So I think going into, a, into investments Looking to target returns can be a, a dangerous space. Of course, there's always, you know, capital has parameters and has hurdles that it requires. But from my perspective, given I'm in the, at the coalface looking for transactions, I'm looking for good deals. I'm looking for quality counterparties. I'm looking to deploy the capital into those good quality transactions and we'll price them accordingly. Has the ratio between the amount of debt investments v equity investments you're doing as a business changed? Uh, it, well, in recent times it has. So we've, again, it's, it's quite cyclical. So in the period 2013 to 16, 
we invested a lot in equity. We felt it was the right time in the cycle to do so. We were um, heavily invested in Sydney, just as the Sydney property market was taking off, uh, both residentially and office. And we then, and, and we had a little bit of exposure in Victoria as well. We sold out of nearly all of those equity investments at the latter end of those years, so around 17, 2018. Um, and then we were quite, uh, we were pretty quiet on the equity front and doing more debt. During that period as well, from about 2017 onwards, the senior debt markets opened up significantly for senior, uh, for non-bank lenders. And so our, um, our balance of investments skewed heavily towards debt. But I think whilst we'll continue on a very strong growth trajectory, I think in, in total dollars, our equity investments will increase significantly over the next 24 months because I'm seeing those opportunities start to present themselves again. An investor we spoke to recently talked about the, the market and said that there's a lot of money out there, a lot of silly money and a lot of very smart money. Given Wingate's experience, how important is it to be a patient investor? I think it's critical to be patient. Uh, the worst thing I think you can do as an investor is be compelled to invest. I mean, we have a, a, you know, a perfect example from our perspective would be our, our second equity fund, which we raised, I think in about 2018, but we had an investment period where it had to be deployed um, by the end of, or actually by some time in this year. Now, given we went through the whole COVID period, we just did not feel comfortable at all that we were going to invest that money. So we actually released our investors from that commitment and returned the capital. Um, and I think that sums up exactly how we feel about that. You know, it's just critical to be patient and wait for those right opportunities. Two final questions to finish. As I mentioned in my opening, you've been involved in property finance for over 20 years. How has Australian property in general changed over the past 20 years? I mean, how much bigger now is the market compared to back in early thousands, late 90s? Well, it's significantly bigger. I mean, stating the obvious, we've had huge migration over those years. Um, we've seen the great urban sprawl take place in certainly in Victoria and well and New South Wales. Um, we're seeing it now through southeast Queensland, lots of land being rezoned, affordable housing being built out there, house and land. So the scale of market in that space has grown significantly. But also Australia in the last um, 10 years, more so than 20, has become a genuine target on a global scale. So commercial property in Australia is on the uh, is a target now for you know overseas investors, whether they be UK, US, or Asian based, um, European based. So I think it's, we're going through a whole transition. We've seen even before the recent um, contractions of interest rates. So going back to 2017, 18, 19, we saw huge amounts of capital, institutional capital, coming in and buying. Um, A-grade office buildings and other major assets in Australia. So I think we've, we're seeing real change in the market and it's terrific for Australia that we're on the international stage. You've been very generous with your time. So my, my final, final question is, what's the biggest risk to Australian commercial real estate over the next 12 to 24 months? If I could be a little controversial, or maybe I'm not controversial, I think it's government. I think it's government policy. I think government policy has the ability to ensure that there's a really healthy, robust real estate sector uh, in Australia. This is both state and federal, and there are various levers that they've got at their disposal to ensure that, from assisting to get international students back, um, tax reform, stamp duty. Um, so I think it can go one of two ways. Um, and I think it's in their hands. So I think that um, all things being equal for reasons I've outlined earlier, I think that Australia has got a pretty bright short to medium future in the real estate space, but the government holds a lot of power in its hands and it can make decisions like it did back in 2017, I think it was, where it just stopped the market. Um, so that would be my comment. Mark Harrison, an absolute pleasure having you on this afternoon. Thanks for your insights. Thanks, been a pleasure.